Hi, our passage this week is uh, Hebrews 5, 1 through 10. Let me go ahead and read from our passage. Hebrews 5, 1 through 10. For every high priest chosen from among men is appointed to act on behalf of men in relation to God, to offer gifts and sacrifices for sins. He can deal gently with the ignorant and wayward, since he himself is beset with weakness. Because of this, he is obligated to offer sacrifice for his own sins, just as he does for those of the people. And no one takes the honor for himself, but only when called by God, just as Aaron was. So also Christ did not exalt himself to be made a high priest, but was appointed by him who said to him, You are my son, today I have begotten you. As he also says in another place, You are a priest forever, after the order of Melchizedek. In the days of his flesh, Jesus offered up prayers and supplications with loud cries and tears to him who was able to save him from death. And he was heard because of his reverence. Although he was a son, he learned obedience through what he suffered. And being made perfect, he became the source of eternal salvation to all who obey him. Being designated by God a high priest after the order of Melchizedek. So in the book of Hebrews, one of the key themes is encouragement for discouraged Christians. And that might very well fit you right now. Uh, It fits all of us from one time or another, if you're a believer in in Jesus. Um, But the the recipients of this letter, of this book, would have uh, been people in persecution and suffering. They would have been tempted to go back from their faith in Jesus back to their Jewish ways, their uh, Jewish system. The goal of Hebrews is to keep our eyes on Jesus. Is the writer is writing to, to, to people who need to keep their eyes on Jesus. It's, it's for us today so that we'll keep our eyes on Jesus, that he's better. Everything in the Old Testament was pointing to Jesus, the, the tabernacle, the the priesthood, the sacrifices, everything was pointing to Jesus. Why would you go back to a shadow of the real thing? If everything is pointing to Jesus, why would you move away from Jesus? So a little background, the Jews had to go through a priest to have access to God. That wasn't always the case. Uh, God created mankind and man and woman to have a relationship with him, to be with him, to be in his very presence. And in fact, in the garden, Adam and Eve got to walk in the garden with God. No separation. But what separated them from God was their sin. They rebelled against God. And we've all rebelled against God. And that separated us from God. Our sin is serious in that it separates us from God forever because he is forever a holy God. And, and we need uh, to be holy to approach him. We need to be um, pure to, be, to approach God. God is so gracious, though, in that he wants to dwell with us. He wants to make a way to be with us. And uh, so he did so in, with the sacrificial system and the priesthood and the tabernacle. Uh, we can't approach God on our own. So he made a way for us to be able to approach him. In the tabernacle and later on the temple, the Holy of Holies was the back part of the temple that only the high priest could go into one time a year. And that's where God's presence dwelt, right there on the Ark of the Covenant. God is so holy and he can't be approached just casually. And so God made a way for, their, for the people's sins to be atoned for. The priest would go in one time a year and sprinkle blood for his own sins and then for the sins of the people. Some of the Jewish audience being written to in Hebrews is asking, is Jesus qualified to be a priest? The writer of Hebrews is showing that Jesus is better than the high priest. Jesus is exactly the priest that you need. The writer of Hebrews compares the high priest with Jesus, starting with the high priest. So what we're going to see here is a chiasm 
a key, a chiastic structure where uh, the writer starts with a broad point and narrows it down, and then he starts back with the narrow and broadens back up. He talks about the priest and several qualifications, and then he compares that to Jesus, how he is our great high priest. So let's first of all see what he says about the high priest, the human high priest. The high priest, uh, number one, the high priest is selected to represent men to God. Verse one, for every high priest chosen from among men is appointed to act on behalf of men in relation to God to offer gifts and sacrifices for sin. He's chosen. He's appointed. God told Moses in Exodus 28 to bring near to you Aaron, your brother, and his sons with him from among the people of Israel to serve me as priests. God appointed them to be representatives for the people because they were people. They could represent people. God didn't choose angels to be priests. He chose people, men, to be priests. They were chosen from man to represent man to God on behalf of man. And he offered sacrifices and gifts for sins. Mankind is separated from God because of sin, and God ordained priests to deal with um, man's sins. Second characteristic of the high priest is that he's able to deal gently with men. See verses 2 and 3. He could deal gently with the ignorant and wayward since he himself is beset with weakness. Because of this, he is obligated to offer sacrifice for his own sins, just as he does for those of the people. The priest could deal gently with the ignorant and wayward, partly because he is also ignorant and wayward. The priest wasn't perfect. The priest was also a sinner, was, was man uh, just like the rest of us. Uh, who sinned, who gave in to temptation. He could deal gently in that he didn't go to the extremes. He, he didn't, it wasn't just about judging sin uh, with no, um, no grace at all. And it wasn't just about just grace without realizing the seriousness of our sin. It was a, it was a balance. That's the idea of dealing gently here in this passage. It's, it's talking about avoiding the extremes. That yes, sin is serious, but yes, we do have a savior. We do have forgiveness of sins uh, that God is offering to us. The, the reason he could deal gently is because he's a sinner. The high priest was also to sacrifice for his own sins. The priest could sympathize and have compassion because he knew what it was like to be human and to sin. The high priest had garments to wear. There were special priestly garments to wear. And uh, those garments represented things. Part of the garments was a breastplate of judgment or a breastplate of, of uh, righteousness. And on this breastplate, there were 12 stones lined up in front of the, the uh, priest's chest, in front of his heart. And he would carry these these stones around, and each one represented one of the tribes of Israel. It actually had its name written on each of those stones. And so what the, what the sim symbolism is, is the high priest was carrying the people to God, was holding them close to his heart. I can imagine a priest coming to receive sacrifice for sin, sac re receiving the sacrificial animals uh, as people were repenting of sin. I can imagine his care because he would know oh too, uh, all too well about what it means to sin and wh what it means to need forgiveness. That's so much better than judgment, isn't it? When we have someone that understands us, that can come alongside us and, and not judge, but to come alongside and understand. In fact, I think we don't confess sin many times because we... Uh, are afraid of judgment. We're afraid that people are going to judge us. Third characteristic of the high priest is that he must be called by God. Verse 4. And no one takes the honor for himself, but only when called by God, just as Aaron was. So Aaron was chosen by God. You couldn't just apply for the job of high priest. There wasn't a job fair with the opening, with the latest openings for high priest. You had to be from the tribe of Levi, and you had to be called by God. There were stories, uh, wild stories, true stories in the Old Testament about people who weren't priests who 
took on the role of priest, the authority of priest, and what happened to them. God takes seriously uh, the fact that he's the only one to choose the priests. So a man named Korah, this is in Numbers 16, a man named Korah and some of his followers uh, started getting disgruntled and started complaining about Moses and Aaron being priests. Like, why can't we all be priests? What makes you guys so special? And Korah read a, led a rebellion amongst the people. So Korah and his followers, um, God, God told everyone else, back up from these guys. Back up and you're going to see what I'm going to do. And what he did, what God did was he opened up the earth and swallowed Korah and his, and his followers. Don't mess with the authority of God, right? When God, uh, God does things a certain way, don't try to take shortcuts. Another person who tried to take a shortcut, well, Korah wasn't about being short, taking shortcuts, but King Saul did. King Saul in 1 thir uh, Samuel 13. King Saul was supposed to wait for the priest Samuel to um, give the sacrifices, uh, to make the sacrifices, but he didn't. King Saul was looking at his watch saying, hey, he's late. He's late. I'm going to do this. And you would think that, wow, what a nice thing. He's doing it for Samuel. He's just, he's wanting to sacrifice to God, but he's not a priest. He's a king. God calls the high priests uh, to do the sacrifices. Because Saul disobeyed God, because Saul wasn't a priest and he took on the role of a priest, God rejected him as king. Another king who took on the role of, wrongly took on the role of priest was King Uzziah in 2 Chronicles 26. He was a righteous king in Judah, and yet he became prideful. It, that happens, doesn't it? Uh, when uh, we do something good and a lot of people tell us, and then we start believing the hype and we become... Um, a little too big for our britches. We become a little big-headed. And that's what happened with Uzziah. And Uzziah went into the temple of the Lord to burn incense at the altar of incense, but he wasn't a priest. He didn't have that authority. So God struck him with leprosy. See, God, God cares about his ways. God, God has a way to, to be with us, to, for us to be able to come to him but it has to be on his terms. Now what happens with the, with the writer of Hebrews, he's, he's been talking about the high priest, the human high priest. Now he's going to show how Jesus is even better than the human high priest. Jesus is called by God. Jesus Christ is called by God. Look at verses 5 and 6. So also Christ did not exalt. That's the first time we see the word Christ here in Hebrews. So also Christ did not exalt himself to be made a high priest, but was appointed by him who said to him, you are my son, today I have begotten you. As he says also in another place, you are a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. So he didn't exalt himself. He was appointed. It seems like he could appoint himself because he's God, but he needed to be appointed by God. In fact, the, the name, the title Christ means the appointed one, the chosen one, the Messiah. He's the Messiah. Jesus is not only greater than Aaron, uh, but he's in, in this passage, we see that he's, uh, he's after the order of Melchizedek. So not, at, not in the line of, of the Levitical priesthood, but after Melchizedek. Who's Melchizedek? He's a priest before Aaron's uh, priesthood. So when Aaron became high priest, uh, when he died, next guy in line comes, next guy in line comes, right? It's the succession of, of priests. Well, Melchizedek was a priest that Abraham met uh, that uh, he, it was said of him that he had, he was a priest forever. And not only was he a priest, he was a king. He was a king priest. So Jesus is a king priest. He's like Melchizedek. Melchizedek is a, is a shadow, right? He's pointing to Jesus. Jesus is the real thing. Melchizedek is a picture of Jesus. But the writer of Hebrews is saying, this isn't this, he's better than the Levitical priesthood because he doesn't die. He reigns forever. He's a king and a priest forever. Number five, 
uh, Jesus Christ is able to deal gently with men. Yes, the high priest was able to deal gently with men because he was human and he was a sinner, but Jesus wasn't a sinner, uh, although he was human. And he went through all the things we go through. He went through temptation we talked about uh, last week. So let's read verses 5 and 6, or uh, 7 through 9. In the days of his flesh, Jesus offered up prayers and supplications with loud cries and tears to him who was able to save him from death. And he was heard because of his reverence. Although he was a son, he learned obedience through what he suffered. And being made perfect, he became the source of eternal salvation to all who obey him. So what it says of of Jesus is, uh, what this is, relate to us, right? He's been through uh, difficult times, in, in fact, to the point where he's crying out loudly in his prayers and, and, te- and tears, calling out to God. Now, we don't know when the specific, specifically what's being talked about here, because Jesus prayed a lot. I would imagine he prayed um, pretty emotionally before the Father, but we do know, it makes me, this passage makes me think of a, of a story of Jesus the night before he was crucified. He's in the garden and he's praying. He's praying with such agony that he's uh, calling out to God, God, please let this cup pass from me, but not my will, your will be done. And what he's saying is, God, if there's another way for this to happen, he's not only thinking about the death on the cross, but he's thinking about the separation when he takes the sins of the world and the Father turns his face, face away. He's thinking about all that's going to take place when he hangs on the cross. And so, so Jesus is crying out to the one who could save him. Now, he says he was heard, but he died. But he didn't stay dead for very long, right? So he wasn't saved from death. He was saved through death. He, he died, but he rose again. So God answered that prayer and that he rose again. He, he lives forever. But he also answered, I think another way that he answered his prayer was that he sent an angel to him there in the garden. He was in such agony. He had, a, however, however that looked, however that works, an angel ministering to him, God sent one of his ministering spirits to him. And he answered his prayer because he had reverence. Jesus had reverence. When we pray and read, we should be holding God in reverence. We should hold him in awe. He's the King of kings and the Lord of lords. The, the writer of, or not the writer of James, James, who writes James, uh, says that the, righteous, the prayer of a righteous man has great power. Nowhere in the Bible does it say that God answers the prayer of the wicked person or those who don't repent. See, Jesus learned obedience, it says. It wasn't that he was disobedient at any time, but he learned obedience, just like he learned a lot of things. He, was, he became human, so he put himself through the need to learn. And the way you learn obedience is by obeying. And so Jesus obeyed, and he obeyed perfectly. He learned obedience through suffering, the text says. Through suffering, If suffering was the main way for Jesus to learn obedience, why in the world do we try to avoid suffering? Anytime suffering comes, we try to look for the the comfortable way. We look for the the way that is not suffering, right? Not that that we need to look for suffering, but why do we try to avoid suffering when suffering is the way we learn obedience? John Piper observes, no one ever said that they learned their deepest lessons of life or had their sweetest encounters with God on the sunny days. People go deep with God when the drought comes. See, in your suffering, your suffering is used as an incredible tool for God to have his way in your life, for you to learn to be more like him. And as Jesus suffered, you can be like your savior, like the one you follow by going through suffering. The Bible says that you're gonna go through suffering in uh, First, Thess- or First Thessalonians 3, 3, Christians are called to suffer. In Acts 14, 22, Paul and Barnabas are talking with uh, followers of Jesus and, and encouraging them to continue in the faith because they're already being persecuted. And he says, uh, they say, it's through many hardships that we will enter the kingdom of God. So just a reminder is discipleships, it's through hardships we're going to enter the kingdom of God. It isn't just through cushy uh, times 
um, comfortable times, um, blissful times. It's going to be through times of suffering. It's going to be through times of hardship that we learn to follow Jesus. Our present suffering is a prelude to our glorification, Paul says in Romans chapter 8. So we are going to be glorified. Jesus is coming again to make all things right. I'm looking forward to that. I'm looking forward to the new heavens, the new earth, new body, new everything, no more death, no more sin, no more temptation, no more Satan. Uh, It's only his good creation as he created it. But before that, the prelude to the glorification is our suffering. Don't despise God's tool of suffering in your life or others. It's painful, but we can be, it can be a beautiful tool to teach us obedience and deeper trust in him. And when you're, just remember, when you're suffering, Jesus is there too. He is the source, the, the passage also says, that he is the source of salvation for those who obey. So those who, those who obey him get salvation. But you might think, well, I thought it wasn't by works that we're saved. But here's the obedience. The obedience that we're called to is to believe, to trust. That's the obedience. To trust Jesus. To to believe what he says. To put your life, put your very life into uh, his hands. That he's he's now your Lord. That's what it means to submit to him, to, to obey him, is to submit to him in every area of your life. And that's not just a one-time shot, but it is a one-time shot. If you haven't ever done that, if it, not one-time shot, but it, there has to be a beginning, right? There has to be a time where you say, that's when I asked Jesus to be my Lord. That's when I received him as my Lord and Savior. Now, the best way that I know, that I see scripturally, just to, to make that, that line in the sand, to make that demarcation from a life lived for myself and a life lived for Jesus is being baptized. He's called us to be baptized. He's called us to be immersed, to be buried under the water and to raise again to newness of life. It, it represents our, our death to ourself and our living for Jesus Christ. And Galatians, we're, we're told that we're clothed with Christ as we're baptized. Have you trusted in Jesus? Have you been baptized? Have you called on his name to be saved? Are you a Christian? So then what's step two? What, what goes beyond that step of obedience, of faith? Well, I think step two is an obedience of faith. It's, it's trusting in Jesus. And then step three is trusting in Jesus, right? And so, yes, there are things that we do, but it's always because we're trusting in Jesus. We don't want to get it uh, twisted around where we think we're doing things for God so that, of course, he's going to receive us, but we're, we're doing things because we trust in Jesus. We're following him. He says to do so- certain things, so we're going to do them because he's our Lord. And of course, we're going to follow him. So are you trusting in Jesus? Lastly, Jesus Christ is selected to represent men to God. Verse 10, being designated by God a high priest after the order of Melchizedek. Again, we're going to look at Melchizedek later. uh, But the idea is that he he is a priest. Jesus is the priest forever. He supersedes all other priests. Um, Who do you want representing you? Do you want a temporary priest or the eternal priest? Do you want a sinful priest or the son of God? Do you want, um, do you want the shadow or the real thing? This book was written to Jewish Christians tempted to go back because of persecution and suffering. Why would you want to go back when you've got Jesus? You need a high priest because God is infinitely holy and you are a sinner. Jesus Christ is that high priest. Flee to him for salvation and live daily at the foot of the cross. I encourage you to trust in Jesus. If you've never done that, if you want to get baptized, uh, please let us know. You can text us at 206-678-1228 and then we'll follow up with you. If you just have questions or you need prayer, please contact us at 206-678-1228. That's our text line. It's just a quick way to get a hold of us. Or you can call the church office or you can, or you can email us. My, my email is kyle at normandychristian.org. Let's pray. God, we thank you for loving us enough to want to dwell with us, that we have rebelled against you and gave every reason uh, to be separated from you forever. 
but God, that you are a gracious and loving and relational God that you want to be with us. And so, Father, I pray that we don't take that lightly, that we don't take lightly the whole, the whole sacrificial system in the Old Testament, that people could not just approach you and people could not just come into your presence. God, thank you for Jesus Christ who went through the veil, who who tore the veil as he died on the cross. He rose from the dead. God, thank you because of Jesus dying on the cross for our sins. We have access to you. Help us to boldly approach your throne of grace. God, I pray that uh, all of us would seek to, to submit more and more of our lives um, every day, increasingly submit our lives to the Lordship of Jesus Christ. It's in his name we pray, amen.